Hello, Real Clinicians. This is Ali Nasse with another Real World presentation for you. I'm joined today by Dr. Shafiq Safi, Real World Endo faculty uh, from Montreal, Canada. Dr. Safi, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Dr. Safi is an excellent young endodontist and educator. He's uh, practicing in Saint Laurent in Montreal and also the founder and director of Centre Endodontique um, in the Montreal area. He's also adjunct assistant professor and lecturer at the University of Pennsylvania and also McGill Universities. Now, uh, Dr. Safi, the title of your presentation today is Root End Filling Materials. Now, this is obviously a topic that is very close to my heart and I've done over a thousand apicoectomy procedures and so on and I'm a very big advocate of this very misunderstood procedure now I believe there's a lot of misunderstanding involved with this procedure uh, lots have changed lots of uh, um, new understanding is available in terms of proper case selection, which is the critical part of success in these cases, as well as the modern armamentarium in order to get better outcomes that we have from those old historical epicoectomy procedures for, uh, f uh, that have been in the literature. As you know, I've also developed this lit technique, which kind of just helps make things a little bit faster and quicker using the modern bioceramic uh, materials, which is why I look forward to listen to your presentation, and I will just pass you the podium here to enlighten Enlighten us with your uh, views of some of these uh, modern root end filling materials uh, used in apicoectomy. So please go ahead. Thank you. So uh, you're correct, Dr. Nasser. As you said, the uh, uh, apical uh, surgeries have been known a lot of changes over the years. And uh, one of the changes is the root end filling materials. But bef before we start about that, I just want to like, give some kind of indication or a proper case selection maybe, as you named it, for an endodontic microsurgery. For example, as we see in this case on the left-hand side, the x-ray, we have a root canal that has been done fairly in a good fashion, meaning that there, uh, the working gland, the obturation level, it's dense. And we also see that the tooth has been well restored. There's a, yeah, there's a pose, there's a nice crown, mechanically it's sitting well and it's doing good. But Eventually, what we see is that there's a persistent or there's maybe recurrent apical periodontitis that we see here uh, radiographically, but sometimes we don't, and we only maybe detect it clinically when the patient comes and says, oh, I have pain in my tooth, we percuss the tooth, and there's uh, pain on percussion. So these cases, usually, I tend to do uh, endodontic microsurgery on, and uh, really, what changed the endodontic microsurgery in the last couple of years is what uh, my chairman calls the endodontic microsurgery triad, uh, Dr. Kim. And it really consists of the uh, elimination and magnification that we have today, the advent of super powerful and performing microscopes. We also have super performing and very well, uh, let's say, user-friendly materials, such as the root different material that we could use during our procedure. And of course, Nothing would have been done if not for the uh, advent of the ultrasonics that we can today safely and adequately and more precisely uh, prepare a, uh, a root and filling in where we could put this root repair material. And so using this endodontic microsurgery triad, and of course there are a lot of other factors involved in there, but the success rate of modern endodontic surgery today, according to the most recent meta-analysis by Setzer in 2010, is 94%. And so in terms of root end materials, although you know the procedure itself is much more complicated than just uh, focusing on root end material, but since this is the main topic of the presentation, what we need is a material that's going to be hydrophilic, because we know that the periapical tissues are very uh, humid. We have, you know, the uh, bone, tissue, blood, so we need something that's hydrophilic. We need something that's going to be biocompatible, will not cause damage to the periradicular areas. We need something that's going to be mitogenic, meaning it's going to induce the mitosis or the division and the proliferation of the tissues. And not only that, we want it to induce the mineralization of the tissues so it's able to reproduce or recreate the same tissues that were in there before the disease, meaning bone tissue, cementum tissue, PDL tissue. And we also want it to seal this canal very well. And of course, to have antibacterial activity so that any bacteria that's left in there after a procedure could be taken care of by this material. Historically, the first, uh, the, the first procedures of these kinds were made using uh, amalgam. But we know today that the amalgam is not a material of choice and it's not even an option in these cases. Maybe it's a bit hydrophilic or I'd like to call it hydro-tolerant, 
but it's not biocompatible at all and doesn't cause any mitogenic effect, doesn't seal well, and of course maybe it doesn't induce the uh, mineralized tissue formation. So over the years, and especially in the beginning of the 90s, uh, the bioceramic family of products came into play in endodontics, and we all hear and we all know about MTA. Uh, also, there is a root repair material that's been out there since I think about 2009 or 10. There are always also other products such as biodentine, but really the most popular that we hear about all the time are MTA and root repair material. material. And <clears throat> this is what I want to talk about today, these two materials to see if there's any difference between them. And MTA has been shown again and again in various studies, uh, in vitro studies, in vivo studies, that it really has great properties and that it really is a material of choice because it's hydrophilic, it's biocompatible, it seals well, it's antibacterial. But however, MTA has a lot of disadvantages or a lot of, let's say, um, uh, issues that comes with it when you want to use it. And the first issue, as we see in the middle section of the slide, MTA comes as a powder, and it needs to be mixed with water or with any, let's say, sterile uh, fluid. And we have to have the right consistency to be able to use it. So I want you to imagine, you know, you're there, you're at your uh, your surgery, you did all the work, and now here is the time to put the uh, root repair, the uh, the root and filling in there, and your assistant has to mix and use all kinds of like uh, instruments to give it shapes and stuff, and it. it tends to take more time, especially in this, in this case where like everything is done, all you need to do is just to put the root and material into its place. Secondly, although maybe it's not very uh, important when we do surgery, but MTA tends to produce staining of the dental tissues. If you use it coronally when you do, let's say, a revascularization, it may be more important, but it's something that we should keep in mind. And also very importantly, in 2004, Lee showed that if there is a lot of, uh, let's say, fluid in the area of the uh, surgery, let's say when you're doing the surgery on an upper molar, or if the infection is big, the acidic environment tends to really slow down and even inhibit the, uh, the, uh, the MTA to be really uh, set. So keeping all these in mind, what we need to see today is how the root repair material really uh, uh, is compared to MTA in terms of these properties. So starting by the most simple things, Root repair material comes as a pre-mixed moldable putty in a small jar that you can open and you can really like take with a small spatula a small amount. You can then really roll it on a glass slab and give it its shape. It's very user friendly. You can take it with your curette or your plastic instrument and right away put it into your uh, uh, root and uh, tip or the, uh, the retrofilling space that you uh, prepared using uh, ultrasonics. So it's, vi it's very uh, friendly. It doesn't require any uh, mixing of, uh, or any uh, water or any fluid. And it's very easily moldable. So it's, it's, a very, uh, it's very pleasant to use. Also, when we look at uh, the staining issue, this is a very recent study coming from uh, 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 Dr. Coley, who, is, who was of my uh, faculty at the University of Pennsylvania. What they did there is that they had a study model, as we see on the left-hand side, they put a test material on the tooth and they closed the tooth with cavit on the apical part and they sealed the tooth with a cotton pellet and cavit on the coronal part. And they uh, watched and, or they monitored the staining using the spectrophotometry using uh, root repair material, gray MTA, white MTA, or just control, meaning that they had no test material in the tooth. They looked at it at zero days and at six months and what they saw is that root repair material is a material that least stained the teeth, gray MTA stained the most, and white MTA stayed in the middle. So we already have two problem solved with the root repair material, meaning it's user friendly, and it does not stain the teeth. Now looking more into the biochemical or biological properties, a very recent study also coming out from uh, one of my uh, co-residents, Ian Chan. He did this study to, uh, really stu uh, to really investigate how biocompatible and, and to, to what extent does the root repair material induce the uh, mineralized tissue formation? So what he did is that he took human bone marrow stem cells, PDL stem cells, and dentin pulp stem cells. And what he did is that he mixed those stem cells in contact with MTA or with root repair material. And after five days, what he saw is that MTA and root repair material 
were as biocompatible to get uh, equally biocompatible when he looked at the survivability of uh, human bone marrow stem cells, but that root repair material performed much more better in terms of uh, in terms of uh, biocompatibility with PDL stem cells and with uh, dental pulp stem cells. When you look at the uh, uh, cell differentiation or to see if it can induce the uh, mineralized tissue to lay down uh, the, the, the tissues, he found that uh, and, and maybe uh, performed a bit better on the human bone marrow stem cells, but they performed both equally on PDL stem cells and uh, root repair material performed better on metal pulp stem cells, inducing them or promoting them to lay out uh, odontoblastic uh, tissue in the periodical air. And now looking about uh, on their leakage uh, property, uh, Nair in 2011 did a small experiment where the, he uh, tested E. fecalis bacterial leakage. His test model is, as we see on the left-hand side of the slide, if you, a, an E. fecalis bacterial suspension was put in a plastic tube and there was a cabrot on the other side uh, of the beaker. There was the test material in, uh, or the tooth in that, uh, in that uh, beaker and with time he watched the stain or the broth changed color when the efficalis was able to diffuse through the root repair material or through white MTA, which is what he used in this case. And he gave enough time for the material, which is seven days to set. And what he found is that white MTA and the root repair material had the same uh, sealing properties, meaning they allowed, or let's say they prohibited efficalis to diffuse into the, uh, into the beaker at the same rate or at the same uh, extent. And talking about uh, antibacterial properties, a very simple yet very uh, uh, important uh, study by Lovato in 2011 just took a bunch of efficalis from an infected root canal, placed them in contact with white MTA and in contact with root repair material, and after a certain time he calculated the reduction in colonies forming unit. And what he found is that the remaining colonies forming unit on the side of MTA and on the side of root repair material were equal. So we see that these two materials really have the same antibacterial and thinning properties. We see that root repair material has also a good uh, biocompatibility, even better com biocompatibility of, of, uh, than the MTA. But, you know, all these studies were made in, in an in vitro, an in vitro fashion. And so well, now what I want to show are studies that were made in, in vivo that really are much more important and really represent more the clinical situations we encounter in, as clinicians. And once again, a very famous study by uh, Chen, uh, where he, uh, what he did is that he induced apical periodontitis in, 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 in canines, in, in dogs. He did uh, apical surgery using MTA or uh, bio or uh, root repair material, as we see in the second uh, x-ray from the left. C stands for uh, root repair material or bioceramic, as we commonly call it. M stands for MTA. And he did a six-month follow-up. Uh, radiographically by taking traditional uh, x-rays, meaning conventional 2D x-rays, and also he did uh, CT scans and micro CT scans on these teeth. And not only that, what he also did is he investigated histopathologically how the tissue and how much tissue adapts around uh, the area when the uh, root repair material was placed. And really this is the first time uh, someone does this kind of uh, uh, study or this investigation to really compare these two materials. And what he found is the following. In terms of x-ray healing, and he used the Molven well-known uh, criteria to, uh, to, uh, to assess the success of his uh, surgeries, MTA and root repair material performed in a very similar fashion, in an equal fashion actually. But on CT and CBCT, and we know these kind of, 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 of uh, radiographic evaluation uh, gives us more three-dimensional view. We can really see the cortical bone. We can really see if there's a small lesion here. We can really see if there's still radiolucency. It showed that root repair material performed better in terms of root filling material during apical surgeries. And he also showed that histologically, root repair material was able to induce mineralized tissue at a higher rate and at a much greater rate than MTA. And this was really a, a dog study. And uh, actually, this was my own uh, master's thesis that I did when I was a resident at University of Pennsylvania. It's not published yet. Uh, hopefully, we're going to get it out there to be published in a very short time. 
this is a randomized clinical trial that had uh, uh, as a goal to investigate if there's any difference between root repair material or MTA when we use it as, as a retrofitting material during surgeries. And I compared the success rate on uh, traditional 2D x-rays using the Molven criteria and I compared the, the success rate also using uh, CBCT, using special criteria that I cannot really talk about it now since uh, because of uh, time constraints, but these criteria, uh, the CBCT criteria were inspired by the work of Chen, and they were after that really approved by various studies, notably a study by Von Arcs, saying that this model of uh, CBCT criteria is a valid uh, model to be able to be used to assess the success rate of endodontic microsurgery on a CT scan. And just to finish, these are a couple of uh, uh, cases uh, that I investigated. In this case, we have a, a premolar, uh, preoperatively we can see the x-ray, postoperatively we can see uh, the uh, very good healing around the periapical areas. At a 30-month follow-up, when you look at the uh, CT scan, for example, we see that there's complete healing, there's complete formation of bone, there's complete formation of the cortical bone, there's no apical radiolucency, and of course, there's no any clinical sign and symptoms. This case was done using uh, MTA, and so this case was uh, uh, was scored as a successful case. Another case, this time using root repair material, we see on the preoperative x-ray, uh, this upper molar, the, uh, root, the uh, surgery was done, and we see after 18 months on the follow-up, very good healing on the PA radiograph. And when we look at a CBCT scan, we see also, you know, there was a missed MB2 uh, initially that was addressed surgically. Uh, the mesial and the distal root, we see that there is uh, 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 very good healing. And we see that, for example, on the last, on the actual slide, that the, uh, the uh, cortical bone has formed, even though there was a missed canal that was only addressed surgically and not, uh, let's say, uh, conventionally by doing the retreatment we see that this material performed very well in this case. And one last case, uh, this also is a very simple case. You know, there's crown on that to it. Uh, root canal was done some, long, some time ago, but there was still clinical uh, signs and symptoms. The uh, procedure was done with the root repair material, a six month follow up, as we see on the uh, CBCT on, on the x-ray, shows that there's complete healing. The cortical bone has formed and thickened and of course, there's no sign and symptoms at all in these cases. And these are only like three cases that I show. Uh, there are a lot of other cases in the master's thesis, and hopefully we'll be able to see them very soon in uh, an article to be published, uh, hopefully. So in conclusion of this presentation, uh, what's important to know is that the kind of root and material that you use is very essential, and uh, it's a very important factor uh, that will dictate the success of your uh, procedure. If you're uh, uh, not, if you're not sure if you should use the uh, root repair material or MTA, well, at least we know that in a clinical fashion, they uh, they uh, they they uh, they perform uh, very good, and they actually perform in a very uh, equal way. But however, that we have to keep in mind that uh, root repair material is more user friendly, and that does not stain the tooth, and that might be sometimes be worth it in order to be to do a better case. Well, Dr. Zafi, thank you so much for this uh, wonderful and enlightening presentation. I think you brought up some very excellent and important points. Uh, you know, for me, I my training dates back to the early 90s, so I learned to do microsurgery off the bat when I started the program, when it was just becoming uh, kind of the, the, the given technique. So um, I learned the microsurgical techniques from the outset, and I was always confused when people were saying apicos don't work because most of the literature has been dating and rehashing and going back to those original studies that were done on apicoectomy where people using were using the naked eye not using any microsurgical techniques we're not using ultrasonics we're using these bb gun round preparations with these micro hand pieces with a beveled a large bevel using an amalgam and most importantly had no idea about case selection. So they were basically applying apicoectomy as a panacea to all failed root canals, many of which were cracked roots, and many of which were missed canals. And we all know that doing apicoectomy in a retrofill on a tooth that has not been treated 
you know, non-surgically and in an orthograde way, has a lower success rate. So understanding how apicoectomy has changed over the years, you know, and I want to go back to what uh, Dr. Kim had said about those triad of uh, endodontic uh, microsurgery being uh, the, the retrofilling materials, the microsurgical techniques, and the uh, armamentarium such as ultrasonics, I'd like to add this additional thing about our better understanding of the theory behind endodontic failure, uh, which has led to case selection, improved case selection. All you know, th th that's a critical thing. I, I find case selection to be really, really important for doing, uh, you know, having a higher success rate. What do you think about case selection as a, as a factor here? I mean, definitely, you know, case selection is very important. And uh, my uh, master's has investigated other factors that really uh, come into play when uh, deciding to do or not surgery. And we see that sometimes, you know, like uh, very large lesions or when there's probings or when there's like other kinds of uh, factors in there tends to yield a lower success rate. So we really have to be careful as clinicians what are we are uh, selecting to do a, a surgery on. And before really condemning the procedure, we have to also know how to do that procedure in a, in a contemporary and a yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, the, the key here is to understand some of the surrounding issues, such as periodontal defects, things that are unrelated to the endodontic failure that are now going to be bunched up <laughs> onto uh, the prognostic factors for the tooth. You know, it's a funny thing. I, I have a, um, a, a colleague of mine who's primarily has an implant practice, and he uh, used to tell me never... I never want to have an apicoectomy done on, on uh, you know, on, on one of the endodontic cases that have been done for me because I believe that they fail. And I say, well, what do you base that information on? And he said that because every time I go to remove a tooth that has had an apico, there is a large lesion at the end of the root that it hasn't healed. And I kind of took a double take because I'm like, do you understand the cognitive dissonance in that statement? Of course, every tooth that you're removing that has failed as an apicoectomy has will have failed, has a lesion. That's why you're removing it. You're not when removing not all the ones that are successful, yeah. right? I mean, it's kind of like me trying to say that, you know what, people in Boston, they never brush and floss because all day long I'm doing root canal therapy on their teeth. Exactly. Right? Yeah. It's going to call the kind of a, the type of bias that you have based on your experience. But studies have shown, as you mentioned, uh, Dr. Kim's studies that, that are really uh, uh, important in terms of even a longer term success rate using microsurgical procedures show the 94% success rate that you were talking about. Now, in terms of the newer materials that are around these bioceramics, you know, first MTA, as you mentioned, and then the uh, bioceramic putty, which of course come, it's very close to my heart because I, you know, I uh, basically have developed it, uh, and the techniques associated with it. So these have also made a endodontic therapy and apicoectomy much easier and more efficient, Correct. specifically now these newer uh, formulations for biceramic putty and the fast set. Um, have you had any experience yet with the techniques that I've developed, with the lit technique, with the, uh, with the kind of sandwich technique of using the injectable material to fill the canal and then using the putty just as a... Um, as a covering, as a lid, if you will, to allow the material to set? I, I haven't done this uh, procedure yet, to be honest, And uh, but I do sometimes, especially, I mean, sometimes what I tend to do is I tend to do my retro prep large, uh, longer than three millimeters. Sometimes I go to six, sometimes I go to nine millimeters. And in this case, I do inject a bit of healer and I take, let's say, after that, like a paper point or something that's long to like kind of uh, spread it around the canal. And then I actually fill all the canal with my uh, root repair material all the way. So uh, I'm still using this, this mixture, of, but not the, the pure uh, technique that... that yeah, that no, I mean, the, 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 the lid technique follows basic, you know, chemistry and just the sure. logical projection of the same because the, the root repair material and the sealer, the RRM injectable material, they're all basically the same basic formulation of ceramics as a calcium silica, Correct. calcium phosphate type cements. It's just in the putty material, you have a little bit more fillers and uh, also the radio pacifier is the uh, tantalum oxide, which is part of the reason why you don't get the uh, staining, obviously. Correct. Um, so, 
they react the same way with each other. So as a result, the, the lit technique is the projecting this idea the same way we do uh, light body and heavy body impression materials for yeah. doing, um, taking an impression. It, thought, it uses the same idea for retrofilling by injecting the softer material so it can flow better, faster, and get into these nooks and crannies so you don't end up needing to do condensation. And then it uses the putty just for the top so it can give you a seal because the syringable material takes long, longer to, to set. The putty actually covers it as a lid, hence the lid technique, so that it allows time for it to, to set. The only issue and the uh, sensitivity of the technique is making sure that the needle that you're injecting with reaches all the way down to the base of your preparation so you don't, have, uh, you don't get a void. That's the only thing. Otherwise, retrofillings using that technique take literally 10 seconds. I mean, right now, we do uh, our epicoectomy uh, cases are done literally within you know, anterior teeth can take 10 minutes and uh, posterior teeth certainly take uh, 20 to 30 uh, minutes, no more. Yeah. And that's Correct. because the key is case selection and the rest of it, with the CBCTs, you know what you're doing, where you're going, and the rest of it is just getting in there and very quickly prepare the retro preparation and then fill it with these now more uh, efficient techniques. So any you're final right. words? Uh, yeah, just another thing, you know, you mentioned something very important saying that there are a lot of studies out there that are that tend to say that this procedure doesn't work. We have to know which studies we are selecting. The content of some studies really when they take into account like the procedure that was done beforehand, like just the conventional surgeries, like you said, but with no magnification, no light, no ultrasonics, no staining, you don't know what they're doing. Of course they're and using amalgam on top of that, of course they're gonna get a lower success rate. And when you combine these studies with the most recent studies, because the older studies are much more numerous, they tend to really decrease the success rate. So we really have to make sure that when you're reading an article about endodontic microsurgery, you're reading something about modern, not, even, not, not only not, 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 not even contemporary microsurgery. It has to be modern endodontic microsurgery to be able to really uh, reflect the reality of what it is today. No, absolutely, and I think that's a great uh, final word to leave on the importance of case selection and uh, and uh, reading the more nuanced aspects of studies before selecting them as a source of reference. So I was joined today by Dr. Shafiq Safi, assistant professor and lecturer at University of Pennsylvania and also McGill University postdoctoral endodontics program and the founder and director of Centre Endodontique in Saint Laurent, Canada. Dr. Safi, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. My pleasure. We will then do. I'm Ali Nasser, and I hope you found this tutorial helpful. <laughs>